Welcome back to Cambridge Inside Out. I'm, <laughs> uh, we're going to take it from the top this time. <laughs> I'm, I'm Robert Winters, and with me again is... And I'm Patrick Barrett. All right, Patrick. So, um, so in the last half hour, we talked a little bit about, you know, the update on the candidates, you know, the... Yeah. Uh, the, the full field that's apparently now pretty much all super settled. qualified people. Yeah. Well, actually, one thing I'm going to say about about this is that I, I had some serious worries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, earlier this year that we were not going to get any interesting candidates or if we were going to get any candidates of any substance, they were all going to be such total radicals and uh, completely unreasonable people. So that the voters would have no choice other than just to sort of you know pick any meeny miny mo, and and just get the 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 least crazy group of nine elected. Well, uh, actually, and, I know, I know it's, it's I actually it has actually I think it, you know and again not just speaking for myself as what I like to think of as the reasonable man, but um, I think we actually have ended up with some pretty interesting candidates now. Not to completely retract my previous, but I agree. I, I actually talked to um, Joan Pickett for the first time because I thought it was pretty ballsy of her to write her op-ed about the, the the bicyclist pledge. And like clockwork, you know, the cycle bros attacked her, but she held her own. She's really smart, qualified. Like I just, I, I was just pleasantly surprised to to talk to a candidate because I have zero faith in our council at the moment um, and hear some, some reasonable stuff. Um, I actually think there are a lot of reasonable candidates. I'm not going to you, you'll have to deal with me if you get up there, sir. Um, but I, um, I think it's, it's hard. Oh my God, no, please. <laughs> I, I think it's heartening to see that actually some people said, you know what, I don't, this is not what I want to do really, but this is, I, I feel like, I think the people are feeling like an obligation because this council currently is so out of their mind that people decided to step up and put their you know, sort of professional lives aside for a moment to take, to take, some public, take on some public service. You know, and, and by the way, I, I should mention that though though I will have to pass, or I think I'll have to pass the baton for the maintenance of the Cambridge candidate pages. I actually did set up most of the gallery, created pages for everybody. Uh, you know, so we're sort of we're sort of getting there. Robert, uh, you're, you're not a, you're not a public entity, and honestly, like I don't see why. I mean, it's, it's good of you to feel that way, and I think people by and large trust you to at least put up their their web pages, but like you've been, you've been used as a resource that I, I learned Cambridge from you, from your website. You know, I think a lot of people do. So well, actually, actually uh, when I talk to people, you know, in my role as a candidate, you know, I get a lot of uh, statements of gratitude, which makes me feel pretty good. It's actually makes me feel almost as good as when my students give me applause in the last class of the <laughs> semester, which always makes me feel marvelous because yeah. it's to say, so I wasn't just, you know, blowing steam here, you know, I was actually trying to do something useful and people at least appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but I, I just said, uh, um, just as a, uh, uh, you know, just as a, I don't know, just as a, an illustration, uh, I think I'm going to do a quick share screen here and just to point out that though it's still very much a work in progress, just at least get it started, which is what I had promised several of the candidates that I would put together the candidate pages. You know, so all 24 of the um, people who appear to have made the ballot um, are actually listed here now. I got a few people. I got some new photos. Look at, at McGurk's picture. He looks like Kenny Rogers. God damn. <laughs> Hair is flowing. He looks like a like well. I can actually, let me, let, me say, horse. <laughs> let me say I, let me say something about being a candidate. Then I'll get talk a little bit more about the pages, which is that one of the joys of being a candidate is that you actually get to participate in the tennis tour, so to speak, with some candid other candidates who are actually kind of really great people, like nice people, people you wouldn't mind hanging out with. And that includes people like Joe McGurk and Paul Toner, Kathy mm -hmm. Zussi, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna because they race side them all because there are many here. Um, I find a few- oh, Wait a second, you're cheating a little bit there. Now, already <laughs> I can see, that's oh, not yeah. what you look like now. Actually, <laughs> somebody sent me email uh, the other day uh, saying like, well, wait, what, Where'd you get that leave it to beaver photo, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just doing that's my that's my little stand in photo while you actually it's, find it. And it's kind it's of very a happy one. days, my friends. Very yeah. happy days. I was in touch with uh, a new candidate, Ha Wang, today. Yeah. Uh, and um, and also I got a, a nice message from uh, Peter Shu, who is the one who 
uh, it appeared he hadn't turned in his papers, but he in indeed had, so he made the ballot. So that was pretty good. I, I put up some of the information on Adrian Klein. I put up some of the information. Adrian uh, Klein, you know, she's the lady from the Globe, who's uh, some well, of yeah. these employees. Exactly, some, exactly. Some of them didn't want to fire her, so she asked the manager to because uh, <laughs> yes. she doesn't like to do things. Um, yeah. Well, whatever, her. whatever. You know, yeah, I, I, don't hope, know. I hope I'm she just can talking see, right see, now. I don't know what I'm saying. Well, you know, I, I don't want to see candidates basically getting saddled with their associations with either organizations or who they're who they worked for or who, I'm, who's I'm, I'm sorry, I, I completely disagree with you. I'm gonna absolutely saddle <laughs> people with the organizations they are a part of and who they've worked for. So like that's who they are, that's who they've been, that's who they've that's their resume leading up to running for city council. All right. You you, you may be right, you know, but I well I'll just express my point of view that I've basically held for the last 20 years of putting together candidate pages. It has always bothered me the way in which organizations and money tried to sort of dominate everything. So we shall dictate and tell you who the right candidates are, is that thing. And then there's the one of like, well, I've got a gazillion dollars to work with, therefore I'm gonna get my name and everything into everybody's home. So the candidate pages were originally set up to level the playing field and to, to some degree at least take the organizations out of the equation so that they really are about the individuals. Some people say, well, I want to be, in, I'm endorsed by so-and-so. Can you put it on the page? And I say, begrudgingly, I might say yes. But I've always wanted to kind of keep the candidates as individuals separate from the organizations. If they want to go selling their organization and their endorsements, that's on them. That's, but that's not on me. Well, I, I think something that I've learned by reading your website, Robert, that Money is a part of politics almost inextricably. However, in Cambridge politics, raising the most amount of money, getting the most money does not guarantee a victory. And in fact, I remember quite, quite clearly when Ken Reeves had raised about $90,000 and he lost. Um, you know, then you got a guy like Craig Kelly who raised like 15 bucks and he won. Um, and then he lost eventually, but you know, you, you get what I'm saying. I, I don't think, I, and I, and I, I understand for a candidate who might be new, new to Cambridge, especially there's a couple of guys who are like, they just literally land here and they want to run for city council, which I always thought is kind of strange, not because you need to be like Mark McGovern and, you know, I have you know, Kim on the Mayflower, although that's nice that you have that history. Um, but I always feel like you have to learn the city a little bit. And I don't know that you can learn the city in a year or a couple of months. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, since I was a candidate a long time ago, <laughs> I, had the, I used to have the sticker. I'm like, when I made I made these buttons. This is the 30 year old buttons. You know, you can you, know, you can sell them on eBay. Is what I've been telling people. <laughs> right? They're vintage. They're really they're vintage. This actually I can say this. This button is older than some of the other candidates. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true actually. <laughs> right. Uh, but you know, one of the things, even though I had actually been living in Cambridge for 15 years, I think when I was first a candidate. I always felt that wasn't very long and that uh, when you're sort of making the rounds as a candidate and going to events that somebody would ask you something about some particular place or some event or something that once happened. And I'd be sitting there like a deer in a headlight because I wouldn't know anything about it because I just hadn't really grown up around here, you know? Well, you know, 30 years later, I don't think I'm worried about that. <laughs> you know? no. no, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that every candidate needs to have been around the block 30 times in order to be a qualified candidate. I'm not at all saying that, but I, I think that there is a certain brand of hubris of, for a person who basically just registered to vote here last year, who just sort of walks in the door and says, hi, I'd like to be your leader now, you know? I think that's why you get a lot of like, repeat policy orders, right? So from candidates who get elected and they've only been here for a short amount of time, you wind up sort of repeating past history through policy orders that they may or may not know either went somewhere or didn't go somewhere. Um, you know, when I entertained the idea that I might run for city council, I remember talking to my dear friend, Dennis Carlone, previously mentioned in the last episode, I think is Emperor Carlone. <laughs> um, and I told him I didn't have enough gray hairs to run yet which he seemed to like that, he, he chuckled, but I kind of meant it because I, to my, just for me, I felt like I had to know this place better than to just run as some, you know, you, usurper developer who was destroying the fabric of our community, which is, which, which would have been my platform, by the way. Um, 
but I think it's, um, you know, you've, you've done a noble effort in getting people out there who honestly, like, I don't know that I would have been so deferential. I don't think I could have been as uh, unbiased um, just because uh, I, I have a lot of bias. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been known to have a little bit myself, but I, I, I work on it. I try and be yeah. as, as, you know, uh, as, um, uh, you know, unlike, unlike, most of my, unlike most of my neighbors, I am imperfect. <laughs> well, at least I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, well, let me just say, I, you know, since we're always on topic, that you know there are some advantages and some really positive aspects of candidacy that I remember from when I was a candidate many years ago, and I'm already starting to remember, and not remember, but actually be introduced anew these days, which is that um, you, when you have a conversation with people and say, oh, you're a candidate, they, they, they actually look at you more deeply. They say, say okay, this is serious now. Yeah. You know, and when they're having a conversation with you, they're literally investing a piece of themselves in you, which is a little intimidating, too, because then you, you feel like, OK, I got to really carry some I got to really carry this now. You know, so, you, you know, there if is a only, responsibility. If only, if only I felt that from the nine ding dongs that are up there right now. And I, I just don't. I don't <laughs> well, think, I, mean, I, don't, some, I, don't, I think I, there's some some people, some some elected officials. Yeah, uh, some candidates they they take their role as a representative seriously. I think that's why I get so upset, Rob, because there are good people on the council. There are great people on the council. I know you and Mark have had your differences, but I like Mark. You know, Denise and I have been friends for a long time. She's a good person. She's a strong person. Uh, you no, know, Toner's. Well, well, you know, I, I was I was coming back from the jazz festival talking with somebody yesterday. And somebody started ragging on Mark McGovern. I said, well, I have my issues with Mark McGovern, especially having to do with the affordable housing overlay. I said, but on the other hand, you got to look at the at issue by issue because in some other ways, he becomes the reasonable man. And then on other matters, he becomes the world's most unreasonable man. You know, and Mark I can say that not, about a number of the counselors. He's not an ideologue. And that's what matters to me right now in this new climate where everyone's an activist and everyone's polarized. You're either for it or you're against it. We don't need public officials behaving this way. And I do think that, you know, they get, they, the council itself allows them to get blocked into a political ideological corner, which I take full advantage of all the time. Um, but to my mind, you should never vote for something because you have to, or you feel like you have to, because if you don't, then, you know, some angry ladies from West Cambridge are going to show up on your doorstep and throw eggs at you. Um, you should vote for things because of the right thing to do. And I think that you know, the AHO argument, which they discussed the other day, and it's ongoing, to my mind, and like talking to the good, some of the really good people at CDB and other people who are professionals in this work, like it, we're watching this conversation being led by amateurs um, who don't really understand the dynamics of the market or, or construction and housing. And we're allowing like the, the one little Band-Aid item for affordable housing to run the entire housing planning development scheme for the city. It is the tail, it's like the flea wagon the dog. You know, it's funny. I, ha I have a little, some crib notes here right in front of me right now. And on that one particular issue, guess what I have under AHO, it wrote, I wrote, uh, it's the, uh, that and bike lanes are the, are the tail wagon the dog, you know? And I would say, you know, in terms of going into the municipal election, even I would say this, even if I wasn't a candidate myself, is that I think it will be a terrible, terrible season for the next three months if, in fact, the entire discussion simply degenerates into a matter of, what do you feel about the bike lanes? Did you sign the pledge? Or uh, if you don't support the affordable housing overlay or its amendments, therefore you must be anti-housing. Well, right? it's, not I mean, even, it's not just anti-housing, you're also a racist. So like that's just- I, I know, I know. But you know, I, I worry that this is how the, the, the discussion will, will go is, is that people who have very narrow interests are gonna basically say, I, shall, I am king here, I shall define the issues. You, the candidate must adhere to my, uh, my well, list of what the two issues are. And I don't think that's the way it really is. The, the AHO is the band-aid that was supposed to sort of help navigate affordable housing while we fixed our zoning, but we're not. Let me be clear about it. 
because you know again I got to watch myself am I being a candidate or am I being a commentator here but I was opposed to the affordable housing overlay when it was first proposed not because I'm opposed to affordable housing but because I thought it was it was badly structured it was based on a presumption that somehow if you're you know if you're if you happen to fit certain criteria you should be allowed to do build three times as much as some other completely reasonable person who's living in the adjacent parcel uh, I did not like, and I still don't like, the notion that members of the public have zero say in the matter. And even worse, even the planning board was taken out of the equation, right? I mean, it, so there that, is an arrogance about that whole concept. I'm a, I'm a zoning attorney, Robert, and to my mind, this was my biggest argument against the AHO. And I didn't, I didn't come out against it, but I, I privately spoke to people who were asking me about it, that like, how can it be that a homeowner who wants to build an addition for the expanding family has to get a variance, but in the same exact building, uh, the affordable housing overlay developer can build a six-story structure. Um, to my mind, we talk, you know, when, when the council talks about how this is supposed to be the equity and the social whatever for all people of Cambridge, they don't really mean that. They only mean it for the group, the constituent group that they're arguing for. So like the affordable housing only isn't for all Cambridge. It's for the affordable housing developers to build what they want. There is there has really been it's a, fine, like, but like it's just say what it is. There there really has been kind of a big lie that has been promulgated for the last, I will say four years. Right? So what you have is a lot of people in this city who have who have every good reason to be bothered by the fact that rents and housing costs are high. Yeah, I'm thoroughly sympathetic to that point of view. But the truth is, is that almost all of those people are, no matter what the AHO does, are still going to be just going around looking for an apartment at a reasonable rent. They're not yeah. going to be filling out an application with Chris Cotter at CDD in order to apply for one of these inclusionary units or whatever. I mean, some of them will. But, but for for ninety percent of the people who have a legitimate concern about affordability of either, for either renting or buying, this is this is providing nothing for them. So just like the the pain that Boston's now feeling with a fifty percent decline in building permits and in dropping, Cambridge will also be facing this issue as well. And I think it's every if you're upset about the cost of housing, the cost of rent, every single decision that the council has made for the past thirty years has led us here. From the beginnings of the inclusionary zoning um, and the uh, the losing of rent control, which was you know we'll see what happens in the Supremes later on, but the 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 adjustment to rent to inclusionary to go to twenty percent and the AHO the AHO is only for that niche group of people who can't afford to live in Cambridge who can afford to be in these pro who can qualify for these programs. But if you're looking for housing affordability. Every single thing this council has done has created a market distortion that in it that completely dumps the cost on the market. So market rate went way, way up. And now things are $1,200 to $2,000 a foot like you're living in the freaking back bay. That is a result of the council not being able to talk about the elephant in the room, which is zoning reform. And actually- Well, you know, Patrick, um, <laughs> now I put on the other hat as a candidate. Uh, one of the ideas I was thinking of was that, you know, if, you know, through some miracle I were to be elected, it would be, I think it would be a really good time to do um, a little bit what Somerville did, only better, which is to so, do a complete relook at the entire zoning ordinance. Be careful for what you wish for, because Somerville rewrote their zoning and their housing construction went from like 1.4 units per resident to about 0.4. Well, but because that's what happens when you have a bunch of kind of brainless progressives who basically have it's all, their, their it's they, they want to basically inflict their own personal wish list. The same socialists who kicked Mike Connolly out of their socialist club um, are the ones dictating policy in Somerville. And those socialists ran housing into the ground by requiring every fourth in, unit in a housing project go to inclusionary zoning. Now no one builds them. Right. What they do build, however, are single family houses. And they're quite expensive. Right. <laughs> right. It's true. But now I'll, I'll say another thing again. Again, swapping, swapping hats here as both candidate and uh, 
and commentator on these things here is I have, I mentioned earlier, I have a, always have a concern that there's a handful of people, and I do mean a handful of people who are going to try and inflict upon you, the voter, what, quote, the issues are. And if left to their devices, you're going to hear nothing but bike lanes and affordable housing overlay. And that's pretty much it. Or, yeah. or maybe some of the incumbents will basically pat themselves on the back for all the ma marvelous mandates they have inflicted on you in terms of, you know, uh, energy and and uh, every, how every you have council, to operate your building. Every council, council, hope, it's almost like it's religion. Like you have to say, like the Hail Mary. Like you have to say, affordable housing is the biggest, most important issue in Cambridge. Otherwise, you kind of like, you have to leave, because right. that's that's all they talk about. But they talk about it in the most insubstantial, empty way that like, if you know anything about the subject, you know, for a fact, certain everything we've done is not going to make housing more affordable. Well, you know, this is and again, I'm, I, I, I do worry about my potential conflicts here, but it is remarkable when I read candidate statements yeah. and, I, and I'm not trying to dissuade people from contributing text and, and position statements from the Cambridge candidate pages. but. The shallowness of some people's statements is really stunning. You know, it's all about how I believe in providing affordable housing for them, but there's no particulars on how to do it other than maybe this sort of lottery, which is the affordable housing overlay, which basically has a few prize winners, uh, but meanwhile actually does nothing for most people who uh, are just- for, I'm for, for affordable housing, open space, and a strong environmental policy. Oh, and, vi bright, and vibrant neighborhoods. Don't forget Vi vibrant, vibrant neighborhoods and preserving the narrative of the character, yeah. but also building yeah. housing for our most vulnerable populations. I, have, I approve <laughs> of transit and mobility and Mike's situations. Like, I could do this for hours, and it's <laughs> nonsense, nonsense. Well, there's there is a it's almost like a convergence. You could you could start off with like many candidates, but their rhetoric all just starts to become one. When I you know so when I first got involved in Cambridge politics and just like paying attention to it, I looked at your candidate page and I my politics are kind of all over the place, but like in Cambridge, I'm a Republican, but like in Texas, I'm a communist, you know? So right. like um when I looked at the candidate statements, that's the thing that stuck out to me the most is like, how do you choose? They're all the same. Well, Patrick, think about how I feel. I'm sitting there <laughs> putting those damn pages together and I'm saying, can you people break out of the box a little bit? <laughs> you know, it's it's really kind of frightening. <laughs> Actually, let me let me let me uh, let me just break a mold a little bit here and just say this is that even though I'm sure everybody's going to talk about bike lanes, you know, yeah. and whether you're for it or again it, you know, Hatfields or McCoy's. Or whether you're, a, you know, an evil person who wants to, you know, uh, destroy tenants, or whether you're going to, you know, be the champion of tenants and whatever, you know, uh, there are other things. I think you and I, I think, understand pretty well the fact that uh, with some of the the vacancies in places like Kendall, we're actually, I, I believe, we're actually on the verge of put some potentially really steep increases in residential property taxes because oh, yeah. of a very rapidly growing budget and the fact that we're banging into the wall of tax classification so that the burden must necessarily start getting mm -hmm. shifted onto residential. Robert, with, with the vacancy rate currently in Kendall Square, the abatements are coming, brother. They are coming. I assume so, I assume so. Um, I think that another issue of some importance is I, I've sort of throw the word representation and representativeness, but I'm not convinced that in our proportionally representative system that we are really proportionally representative of much of anything on the Cambridge City Council or the school committee. The only I thing that are... proportional representation does, Robert, and this is, I'm, I'm saying this as a Cambridge outsider looking in, is guarantee that one, at least one lunatic gets on the council. That's a proportional. <laughs> well, that, that might be so, that might be so. Another thing of some importance to both you and me, Patrick, is the fact that there are some important places in the city like Central Square, which you know could eat, could really head south if people oh. if there isn't some really serious concerted effort. But it's not going to, Robert. We just had our big board meeting and Mayor Siddiqui said she had a plan for Central Square. She's going to rezone the whole thing. I was amazed. And wait, what wait, is she going to turn it into? I God God help us. God I think us. she actually she doesn't have a plan. She, she was just right. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and other, some of these things actually cross over to some of the school committee related issues too. But I, I, I worry sometimes about what it would be like 
being 14 and 15 years old in Cambridge, growing up in Cambridge and saying, That's well, what kids. do you do? What do you do? You're in your kid here. What do you do? Where do you hang out? What can you do? You know, and it just seems to me all of the priorities are for everything but you know, as, as, as just, a parent, it, Robert, it, I can guarantee you that's the, that's the feeling that most parents have, and that's yeah. why they, that's why we see continually see our friends leave. Um, my my children have a, have gone through like a best friend every year because they either grow out of their homes or they kind of realized that they're almost not wanted here. But but hey, Patrick, they can just go play in the bike lanes, right? <laughs> that's all the recreational uh, opportunities you could ever possibly want. Now, by the way, I don't want to be such a naysayer. I mean, there's Cambridge Youth Soccer, there's some of the little leagues, and and I think some parents are actually finding really good outlets for the kids. But if you just if you're just 15 years old and you want to do something other than drugs, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a bit of a challenge in an urban environment like this, and I I worry about that sometimes. You know, uh, on the school committee side, uh, you know, I hope that there are more than a few candidates who actually want to talk Turkey. About Eugenia is like, the one that rises to my mind as the, as the best candidate out there. Eugenia, well, there are actually are there are a few others, and I, I want to learn more about them. Uh, anyone, the anyone that's Hudson. talking about algebra and science, you got my vote. I agree, and and you know, and I think this is this is a pretty important thing, and it has and and shocking shockingly, it has nothing to do with bike lanes or the affordable housing overlay. Yeah. Right. You know, in fact, actually, in day to day living most of what people think about, worry about, want in a place like Cambridge or really anywhere is not about those one, those two issues that the endorsing organizations are going to tell you are the only things that matter. Bike lanes and affordable housing are really are easy. You're either on or you're off. It's almost like a binary decision and it's, and it's almost meaningless in whatever your position you take. Yeah. To actually talk about some of the substantive things that affect families and people who actually live and use Cambridge, yeah. that's hard. Well, anyway, we're going to have to cut it off now, Patrick. So, but we'll be back soon enough on Cambridge Inside Out. News. Yes.